small break. So I would like for you to take your seats. Um, and I would like to directly welcome Mr. Weber, Ms. Garcia Perez, and Mr. Verhofstadt. I want to welcome all three of our guests and, and thank them very much for being here with us today on this uh, very important debate, um, a debate on uh, the European uh, way of how we will move forward and uh, to see, of course, uh, how the conference on the future of Europe will unfold. For us, it is the most important uh, action that the European Union could have taken in these difficult times. So welcome, uh, our dear guests. Your participation today is a proof that uh, you are true allies of the EU's one million regional and local leaders who continue to struggle to overcome the pandemic and deliver a green, sustainable and just European recovery for every region and city. Our committee, of course, welcomes the Conference on the Future of Europe. We will contribute to its success through our political work and we will hold local dialogues with and in our regions, cities and villages, as you know very well and we have discussed. Our goal is your goal, to strengthen every part of our European House of Democracy and bring Europe closer to the people it serves. Regional and local elected politicians represented in the EU by our committee and members of the European Parliament, the only EU institution whose members are directly elected by citizens must come together to make the Conference of the Future of Europe a success. We understand the needs of our people and we give this conference a democratic legitimacy. Our common goal should be to respond to our citizens' call for a union that fully respects the principle of subsidiarity. The conference must make the EU more resilient to new emerging challenges from health to climate, from eradicating poverty to promoting democratic values. Our future lies in a stronger, more united European Union. We will only be able to tackle major crises like the one we just had with the pandemic. And the only way that we will be able to tackle threats is together. The most effective way to delivering the just, green and digital transitions is by strengthening the democratic legitimacy and our decision making. Our children and future generation of Europeans need action today. So let's work together to create a permanent dialogue with citizens and build a Europe that delivers on the real needs of people on the ground. We can, we must, and we will bring Europe closer to its people. So thank you very much for being here today. And I directly give the floor to Guy Verhofstadt, one of the co-chairs of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Mr. Verhofstadt, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, President. And I want, first of all, uh, to thank you uh, for the uh, invitation uh, to have this debate together with uh, uh, the Committee of uh, uh, the Regions. Uh, and if you allow me, um, uh, I want to, uh, uh, to raise two issues. Uh, that is, first of all, why this conference? And secondly, how and how uh, we're going to work together, uh, European Parliament, national parliaments, and uh, the Committee of the Regions uh, to make it a, 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 a success. Uh, the why of the conference, I think that nobody doubts anymore of, of the need uh, to have a, a conference on the future uh, of, of Europe. Uh, we 
have seen uh, in the past uh, a number of crises, the aftermath of the financial crisis. We have seen Brexit. Uh, we have an ongoing migration crisis. We have uh, our, our weaknesses uh, in, in, in our neighborhood. And we have now a COVID crisis, a health crisis, that has uh, clearly indicated uh, that uh, to tackle it, uh, only on the European level, we are capable to do so. But all these uh, uh, crises have one uh, thing in common, and that is that they have illustrated, they have shown, they have proved that um, the Union as it works today uh, is in fact not fit for purpose, not fit for the uh, 21st uh, century. We are in, in many cases, in many circumstances, we act or we act too slowly, uh, ineffectively. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, to organize uh, this uh, conference on the future uh, of Europe is, exact, is exactly that, to examine that and uh, to repair what needs to be repaired and to propose a vision uh, for uh, the future. Uh, it is not the first time that uh, we try to do this, but it's in a unique experience in the way that were in the past, and I remember me very well, uh, the convention of so many years ago uh, and other initiatives were in the past, every time when we discussed the future of our European Union, this was an initiative of one of the institutions in which then other institutions, Parliament, uh, Commission were invited. This time, this conference uh, has been launched as a common initiative uh, of the three institutions. Uh, together also with the representatives of the national parliaments and with uh, the presence and the active involvement uh, of the uh, committee uh, of uh, uh, the regions. And, and that is unique, uh, unique in the sense that uh, uh, I know that there is a, number, a lot of scepticism about the outcome of the conference. Well, will the outcome be taken into account? Well, I think the fact that this conference is launched by all three institutions with also the full participation, active participation of national parliaments and the committee uh, of the regions is as a guarantee that nobody, that no European leadership afterwards can deny the results of the conference. And the second way in which this conference is unique is naturally that we want to give uh, a place to an active participation uh, of uh, the citizens in uh, the whole process. As you know, the, after the summer break, there will be four in three rounds citizens panels that will be organized uh, with as goal to know from the citizens, to receive from uh, the citizens their proposals, their recommendations, their wishes about the future of the Union. And it will then be the, the task of the conference and especially of the plenary of the conference to respond to these recommendations, to respond to these uh, proposals and to these wishes with concrete ideas for reform of the Union. Uh, reform that can go in, in, in different ways. We can talk about policies, we can talk about institutions. I'm always thinking that it is stupid to make a, a division between policies and institutions. Without institutions, you cannot develop policies. And the reason uh, why you do that is because uh, of policies. So it make no sense uh, to make a, a split and, and to make an artificial division uh, between both of them. So there are no taboos in this conference. It will be based on uh, the citizens' uh, wishes and recommendations, the input, but it will be uh, the task of the representatives uh, of the citizens, European parliamentarians, national parliaments, representatives of the Committee of the Regions, to then define, uh, describe, propose, and decide on how or how to reform the Union so that uh, yeah, the weaknesses of the Union uh, the slownesses of the Union and uh, from time to time the fact that we are ineffective uh, can be solved. There is always a, a question, and, and I conclude with that, that comes back. Will it be possible to change the treaties? Well, it's not the first question that we will answer. First question what we will answer is what needs to be done? And then comes only the second question.
can that be done inside the treaty as we know them today? In any way, we have secured that in the uh, platform that launched uh, this, uh, uh, this conference, this is not forbidden. Like I said, there are no taboos, and uh, it is the, the purpose of this conference uh, to uh, really develop a vision together with our citizens, uh, uh, implemented later on uh, by uh, the representatives, uh, national parliaments, European Parliament, and the other institutions of the Union. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Verhofstadt, for your insight and your uh, very, very uh, hard work for making this conference a success. And I want you to know that uh, personally as president, but all the members of the Committee of the Regions and the group who uh, will be representing us in the conference on the future of Europe, is we are all dedicated to make this conference a success. So uh, I would like to give the floor now to Manfred Weber, please. President Tsitsikostas, uh, dear Apostolos, dear friends from the Committee of Regions, uh, dear Guy, dear Rache, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you some of the ideas we have in mind when we now start with this, uh, with this project of uh, Conference for Future of Europe. Um, uh, Eva Hofstadt, I think, already answered uh, the first question, and that is, is the conference needed? I think everybody who, who has a fair look to what is happening in today's European Union knows that there is a much to discuss, very much to discuss. And probably the real question is whether we can, having the last 10, 15 years in mind, that we can overcome the management in Europe driven by crisis, so migration, Euro, Brexit, COVID, and then to react and improve Europe, or whether we can change it and can come to a mechanism where we say, okay, we look to the next decade in front of us, what are the challenges and try to do our best to answer things before we are in the middle of a crisis. Yeah. That would be a dream if we can achieve this. And uh, that is, let me say, one of the uh, key questions, whether we are capable to do so, to change the whole mechanism of Europe, uh, of European development. The uh, key question is uh, additionally, whether there is a chance to bring things alive. He also mentioned this already. Uh, I would say there is a big chance. When I see already the Strasbourg spirit, so the first meeting, I can say for my caucus, for my EPP group, there was a very good spirit where people were together who wants to discuss now, wants to be creative and wants to achieve something. And also on the council side, yes, we know there are some colleagues uh, reluctant and skeptical on the process, but others are forward looking, are motivated. So I think if we have good ideas, if we have a solid base on facts, then we can achieve something. I think there is a chance and we have to use it. I also share that this involvement of citizens is uh, the precondition. Modern politics starts with listening and especially what you from the Committee of Regions have to contribute is in this regard crucial. Uh, you have the best idea about what people in their daily life need and what they expect, especially from Europe. You are close to them and that's why you are key partners. I myself, my group and uh, all the other groups, so Guy and Irachi, we supported the general idea to increase the number of participants from the Committee of Regions inside of the Conference of U Future of Europe. Uh, I think that is respected uh, and that is a good decision. Um, if I may say that listening is important, but uh, let me add that for me, the more exciting thing is then also the question of how. So how can Europe answer the demand, the requests, the wishes of our citizens? And there, I think that, for example, we have to consider to strengthen the executive uh, side of the European Union. At the moment, Europe is a great uh, legislator. So we are creating legal base for Europe on Schengen, on Euro, on single market, on climate change. But when it is about the executive side, we have not so much uh, possibilities to do so. So, for example, strengthening Frontex, building up a European defense on, against cyber war, a brigade, for example, on this task, or to be also ready to be on the global markets in the, in the economy more, more, more present. So to strengthen the economic, uh, the executive side is for me one of the pillars we have to discuss. Uh, for sure, the whole debate about foreign affairs and strengthening the defense pillar will be in the center. That's obviously 
one of the main fields where we are currently not capable. Look to Russia, to Turkey and to China as the biggest challenge. We are not capable currently to really give a proper European answer and their Europe is too weak, is not capable to deliver. So that is for me one of the questions of the how. Uh, I also want to underline that the idea of a democratic Europe is still not yet finalized. Uh, uh, and I think we have to work on this. Uh, I'm a member of European Parliament. I think the European Parliament has a strong democratic base. More people participated in the last European elections. We can be proud about this. But uh, uh, especially when it is about the idea of lead candidate, the idea of transnationalist, or even the idea of a direct election of a president of the European Council, for example, to elect directly a president of Europe. So only to consider some uh, options on the table, uh, I think there is a lot to do, a lot of improvements still possible to make Europe more democratic, to simply link it to citizens. And having this principle in mind, I tell you that this is probably the most important task Having Brexit in mind, where Boris Johnson told people, I want to have my sovereignty back because Brussels is not my Brussels, Europe is not my Europe. Uh, that was uh, the main message of Boris Johnson. That gave us a clear lesson that we have to improve democracy on European level. Uh, the value base is already mentioned. And uh, the idea and the question, which uh, also Guy mentioned on the treaty change, uh, I would even go one step further. I would say, Look to health, look to Corona. Currently, health is not an European issue at all with our Lisbon Treaty base. Huh? And having this in mind, for me, it's obvious that the treaty change is necessary. Again, uh, we still discuss it and we still uh, have to assess this. But uh, I myself, I would be ambitious on this and would go even for such a step, probably limited treaty change, but some adjustments are necessary. And finally, in all these points, I think we, we share this as politicians, there is an inclusive approach necessary to listen and to participate, uh, to look for participation of citizens. But on the other hand, on, there's always leadership also necessary in politics. You need people who show what do we have to do to overcome the crises in the future. Uh, this kind of leadership is hopefully there in Europe. And together, if we can count on the support of the Committee of Regions, uh, Apostolos, I think there is a good chance that we make out of this exercise a real, a real success story, a new chapter for Europe. Thank you very much, Manfred, uh, and thank you very much for your very visionary uh, points uh, uh, and very clear points that you made. Uh, I'm sure that we will be able to collaborate together uh, to make this conference a success. In, in this very correct, in my opinion, uh, directions that you uh, just uh, described. So uh, let me give the floor now to Irache Garcia Perez. Ms. Garcia Perez, you have the floor. Thank you, President Chicostas. Uh, thank you for, for uh, organizing this important uh, event with the members of the Committee of the Regions and, of course, for uh, inviting uh, me to participate as a member on the Security Board uh, for the uh, conference uh, by the European uh, Parliament. I think that it's uh, essential to strengthen our cooperation between both uh, institutions and this is a big opportunity to start uh, with this uh, cooperation. Uh, para el Grupo de Socialistas eh, y Demócratas, esta pandemia eh, tiene que acabar siendo eh, una oportunidad para volver a lo esencial, ¿no? para restaurar el espíritu de la solidaridad. Eh, si la COVID-19 nos ha enseñado algo es que somos una comunidad eh, donde dependemos los unos de los otros, desde comprar eh, la comida a nuestro vecino que estuvo aislado y, y necesitó de nuestra ayuda, eh, hasta cuestiones mucho eh, más globales, como es la de la eh, estrategia global de, de vacunación eh, para garantizar eh, que todos eh, podamos acabar con esta pandemia. Eh, por lo tanto, eh, debemos actuar como lo que realmente somos, una comunidad que se preocupa y cuida de sus personas. Nuestro futuro nos incluye a todos y a todas, eh, y por ello tenemos el deber eh, de poder celebrar este debate fuera de la burbuja de, de Bruselas, fuera de nuestras instituciones, fuera de nuestros espacios y abrirlo a la ciudadanía. Y por eso el rol tan importante eh, que tiene el Comité de las Regiones y que tenéis todos vosotros y vosotras eh, para poder ampliar eh, un debate en una ciudadanía que necesita eh, también trasladarnos cuál es su idea de, de Europa. 
Esta es la razón por la cual eh, vosotros también sois miembros importantes eh, eh, de la Conferencia de, del Futuro de Europa como Comité de las Regiones. Debemos también dar un rol relevante a la gente joven. Al fin y al cabo, la hoja de ruta eh, final ha de encauzar el futuro de la Unión Europea para las próximas décadas y por eso mismo un tercio de los participantes en los eh, paneles de ciudadanos eh, serán eh, jóvenes de menos de 25 años. Es una decisión que, tomados, que tomamos colectivamente los miembros del órgano ejecutivo y que creo eh, que señala el compromiso ¿no? por, por eh, intentar ampliar este altavoz y que sean los jóvenes los verdaderos protagonistas también de nuestra conferencia. Necesitamos, además, eh, la experiencia de la sociedad civil organizada así como la involucración de los agentes eh, sociales para que puedan darnos su opinión sobre todo este proceso. La pandemia ha tenido tal impacto que no podemos dar una respuesta convencional, eh, todo lo contrario, debemos hacer un cambio de paradigma eh, repensando eh, nuestra sociedad y nuestra economía y poniendo a las personas en el centro eh, de nuestros debates, eh, incluyendo el progreso ecológico, sanitario, y social, que permita una transición justa. Esta conferencia, que estaba planteada ya antes de la crisis, coincide en un momento que tenemos que aprovechar. Nos encontramos ante un contexto histórico y político nuevo, eh, en el cual lo público y la solidaridad han de volver al primer plano. Reforzar la dimensión social de la Unión Europea y promover la solidaridad, la cohesión, la justicia, la protección social como centro de acción ha sido una prioridad para los socialdemócratas desde siempre. Desafortunadamente, en los últimos años, como respuesta de la crisis del 2008, desde las instituciones europeas se dio una respuesta en la que la austeridad era como uno de los principios fundamentales y olvidamos a las personas como el centro de nuestro debate. Y por eso también hemos visto cómo nuestros sistemas públicos se han visto deteriorados y han respondido de una forma mucho más débil a una pandemia global como la que nos encontramos. Por eso creo que es un momento importante para poder abordar este, este debate. De momento ya hemos visto cómo esas recetas del pasado no fueron las idóneas y tenemos ahora mismo un instrumento como es el Next Generation EU que puede abordar ese cambio de paradigma al que nos referimos, ¿no? de, de, de cómo modernizar nuestras economías, de cómo hacerlas más resilientes y de cómo abordar los retos y los desafíos que, que tenemos. Como dicen claramente los eh, tratados, la Unión Europea es una comunidad de valores, no una organización económica. Y aún así, este último fin de semana hemos sido testigos de anuncios en medios europeos por parte del Gobierno húngaro promoviendo la reducción de la Unión Europea a un simple mercado. Esto sería un error fundamental y de esto también tenemos que hablar en la conferencia sobre el futuro de, de Europa, eh, sobre los valores eh, de la Unión que sustentan un proyecto eh, político que va mucho más allá eh, del simple mercado. Esta crisis ha dejado claro una vez más que el mercado ni lo soluciona todo ni lo recompensa a todos los sectores, lo cual es clave para el bienestar de nuestra sociedad. A modo de ejemplo, tomemos la falta de autonomía estratégica para producir vacunas, la falta de inversión en nuestros servicios de sanidad, la falta de profesionales en el sector sanitario o las precarias condiciones laborales de tantas y tantos trabajadores. Durante la conferencia espero que podamos abordar, abordar también el lanzamiento de la Unión Sanitaria. Espero que la conferencia proponga el fortalecimiento de la dimensión social. Durante demasiado tiempo hemos dejado en un segundo plano este elemento. Las políticas económicas no han ido acompañadas lo suficiente por medidas sociales. La pobreza y la desigualdad ha incrementado eh, y la situación empeorará eh, con esta crisis a menos eh, que pongamos encima de la mesa todas las soluciones para que esto no sea así. Necesitamos volver a priorizar a la ciudadanía, a escucharla. No puede ser eh, que hagamos eh, un debate sin tener en cuenta el gran desafío en el que nos encontramos en estos eh, momentos. La Unión Europea se ha ido desarrollando y superando cada crisis y esta vez no debe de ser diferente. Esta vez es una unión en constante desarrollo, más que nunca eh, que necesita eh, abordar los cambios eh, necesarios y para mí esta conferencia representa 
el inicio de un nuevo paso para seguir avanzando. Necesitamos cooperar, necesitamos escucharnos, necesitamos hablarnos y poder organizar estos eh, debates eh, tan eh, necesarios en un momento como el que nos encontramos. Así que me pongo a vuestra entera disposición, eh, tanto personalmente como presidenta del Grupo de Socialistas eh, y Demócratas, para poder avanzar en estos desafíos comunes. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia Perez. Um, I would like to open the floor now to our members for our debate, and I would like to give directly the floor to Mr. Geblevich uh, from the EPP for two minutes, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Dear Chair Garcia Perez, uh, dear Chair Verhofstadt, dear Chair Weber, dear Manfred, and it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the EPP group in the COR, we value greatly your efforts for start the start of the conference on the future of Europe. For many years, regional and local uh, uh, leaders have been the best ambassadors of the EU policies decided in Brussels. We have explained the benefits of the EU to our citizens. We have defended Europe regulations, and we have implemented regulation metic meticulously. In Polish voivodeship, in the German Landa, in the Spanish autonomous communities. Today, we have different level of ambitions. We are now ready to be co-creators in European decisions and to go beyond consultative role which we have. We have at least three good reasons. First, we have the expertise and detailed information about which leg leg legislation works for our citizens. Second, we have political legitimacy through elections, the closest possible to voters. We have daily contact with our citizens and we get constant information on their needs and demands with current consultations too. Last but not least, we have institutional structure with the COR, which is already in the loop of the legislative, legislative process. We expect that conference will bring these fun functions together and create structured way to involve citizens through their regional representatives on a permanent basis. I would like to hear your opinions on how we can strengthen our role in the work of European Parliament's report, for example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. The floor now to Mr. Speich from the EPP for two minutes, please. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Europäischen Parlaments, ich freue mich sehr über die Möglichkeit eines Austauschs mit Ihnen zu diesem extrem wichtigen Thema. Die interinstitutionelle Zusammenarbeit im Rahmen der Konferenz zur Zukunft Europas ist aus meiner Sicht essentiell, um in der Konferenz politisch wirksame Ergebnisse zu erzielen. Und ich möchte daher für einen engen Austausch zwischen dem Ausschuss der Regionen und dem Europäischen Parlament werben. Und ich glaube, das ist ein guter Auftakt heute. Bei der konstituierenden Plenarversammlung war spürbar, dass der Wille zu einer ernsthaften Debatte zur Zukunft der Union und auch der Wille zur Veränderung da ist. Und ich wäre ja ganz bei Herrn Weber, dass wir das ambitioniert angehen müssen. In meinen Augen müssen diese Veränderungen nicht nur auf Politikfeldern liegen, der Bereich Gesundheit ist angesprochen worden, sondern auch institutionelle Reformen umfassen. Zum einen glaube ich, dass wir das demokratische Prinzip der Union stärken müssen. Ich denke beispielsweise an ein Initiativrecht des Europäischen Parlaments, das immer wieder zurecht gefordert wird. Gleichermaßen müssen wir aber auch eine verstärkte Anwendung der Prinzipien der Subsidiarität und Verhältnismäßigkeit in den Entscheidungsprozessen der Union gewährleisten. Subsidiarität darf nicht als ein Verhinderungsprinzip gesehen werden, sondern vielmehr als ein Instrument einer effizienten und wirksamen Umsetzung und Kontrolle von Gesetzgebung. Eine Stärkung der subnationalen Ebene in dem Zuge ist deswegen auch kein Selbstzweck. Sie ist erforderlich, um die Expertise gerade mit Blick auf die Auswirkungen europäischer Gesetzgebung 
wirksam zur Geltung zu bringen. Für eine Reform der Arbeitsweise der EU müssen wir das Rad nicht neu erfinden. In der Vergangenheit wurden bereits konkrete Vorschläge zu EU-Reformen ausgearbeitet. Ich denke da zum Beispiel an den Bericht der Taskforce für Subsidiarität, Verhältnismäßigkeit und weniger aber effizienteres Handeln. Mit diesen sollte man sich erneut intensiv befassen. Ich freue mich auf die gemeinsame Arbeit in den Arbeitsgruppen der Konferenz zur Zukunft Europas und hoffe, dass die Ideen und Vorschläge der Bürgerinnen und Bürger dann auch zu Veränderungen führen. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. The floor now to Mr. Karl-Heinz Lamberts from the PES for two minutes. Sehr geehrter Herr Präsident, sehr geehrter Vertreter des Europaparlaments. Nach einer langen Inkubationszeit hat die Konferenz endlich das Licht der Welt erblickt und ihre Arbeit aufgenommen. Im Frühjahr 2022 sollen Ergebnisse vorliegen. Das ist ein enger Zeitplan, der auf keinen Fall zu einer Zwangsjacke werden oder gar zu belanglosen und unbefriedigenden Ergebnissen führen darf. Die Europawahlen 2024 sind der eigentliche Zielhafen, der angesteuert werden muss. Mit der Konferenz sind viele Erwartungen und Hoffnungen verbunden. Diese dürfen nicht enttäuscht werden, denn das hätte fatale Folgen. Dasselbe gilt auch für die vorgesehenen Bürgerdialoge. Zu oft werden Bürgerinnen und Bürger befragt und zu oft wird sich dann nicht mehr oder nur ungenügend um die Umsetzung der Schlussfolgerungen gekümmert. Das darf diesmal nicht geschehen. Der beste Weg, dies zu verhindern, besteht darin, die lokalen und regionalen Gebietskörperschaften mit, ihnen mehr, mit ihren mehr als einer Million gewählter Mandatare in die Arbeiterkonferenz einzubeziehen. Dabei kann und will der ADR eine wichtige Rolle spielen. Kolleginnen und Kollegen, um zukunftstüchtig zu bleiben, muss sich die Europäische Union aus einer Reihe von Schieflagen befreien. Einige davon, davon möchte ich aus der Sicht der SPE-Fraktion beim Namen nennen. Da wäre der Werteverfall in Sachen Gleichheit, Toleranz, Rechtsstaatlichkeit, Demokratie und Solidarität. Da ist auch die ungenügende Handlungsmöglichkeit im Bereich der sozialen Gerechtigkeit und der Daseinsvorsorge. Da ist ebenfalls die Begrenzung der Investitionsmöglichkeiten der Staaten und der Gebietskörperschaften. Und da ist nicht zuletzt auch das Demokratiedefizit, das wir auf der Entscheidungsebene in äh, dem Bermuda-Dreieck zwischen Rat, Parlament und Kommission immer wieder erleben. Darüber hinaus gibt es viele gute Gründe, in Anwendung des Subsidiaritätsprinzips einiges an den europäischen Entscheidungsfindungsprozessen vom Kopf auf die Füße zu stellen. Es geht darum, wirklich die Menschen da zu treffen, wo sie leben. In ihren Köpfen und in ihren Herzen muss der Mehrwert der Europäischen Union deutlich werden. Danke schön. The floor now to Birgit Onet for two minutes from the PS Group. Ich war das du, Herr Präsident. Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, vor knapp zwei Wochen hat sich die Konferenz zur Zukunft Europas konstituiert und ich freue mich sehr, dass ich als Vertreterin des Deutschen Bundesrats mich in die Konferenz einbringen kann. Ich freue mich aber genauso, dass der Ausschuss der Region in der Plenarversammlung vertreten ist und dass eine Koordinierung aller ADR-Vertreter, Vertreterinnen unabhängig von der entsendenden Institution vorgesehen ist. So können wir gemeinsam die regionale und lokale Ebene im Blick halten. Die Bürgerinnen und Bürger der Europäischen Union haben mit der Konferenz die Möglichkeit, ihre Ideen und Vorstellungen zu äußern, wie die Europäische Union zukünftig aussehen soll. Dabei ist uns allen klar, seien es Fragen der sozialen Gerechtigkeit, des Klimawandels, der Digitalisierung oder auch Fragen der Rechtsstaatlichkeit, die regionale und lokale Ebene muss immer mitgedacht werden. Ein starkes und zukunftsfähiges Europa kann es ohne seine Region nicht geben. Nach den allgemeinen Erklärungen geht es nun darum, konkrete Vorschläge der lokalen und regionalen Ebene auf der digitalen Plattform der Zukunftskonferenz einzuspeisen. Die Uhr läuft. Hier besteht für uns eine wichtige Aufgabe in der Plenarversammlung. Wir müssen sicherstellen, dass die Ideen der Bürgerinnen und Bürger, wie die EU und die Regionen in Zukunft noch besser voneinander profitieren können, am Ende auch sichtbar werden und maßgeblich in die Ergebnisse der Konferenz einfließen. Zudem ist mir noch ein weiterer Aspekt wichtig. Wir müssen uns auch den Ideen der Bürger und Bürgerinnen annehmen, deren Umsetzung unter Umständen Vertragsänderungen einfordern würde. 
Auch diese gilt es, transparent zu machen und offen zu diskutieren. Keinesfalls sollten wir diese Ideen von vornherein aus der Debatte ausschließen. Die Konferenz ist eine einzigartige Gelegenheit, die Bürgerinnen und Bürger der EU mitzunehmen bei der Erneuerung unserer Gemeinschaft. Für eine Union, die mehr ist als nur ein Wirtschaftsraum, die Identität stiftet und den sozialen Zusammenhalt stärkt. Es liegt auch an uns allen, dass diese Chance genutzt wird. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Vielen Dank. The floor now to Mr. Igea Arisketa from the Renew Europe Group for three minutes, please. Muchísimas gracias, señor presidente. Bueno, es un, un honor representar eh, a Renew Europe, al Partido Liberal y a mi región en esta conferencia. Europa ha demostrado eh, en esta crisis la importancia de su existencia, la importancia eh, de poder afrontar un reto global. La gente ha entendido, los ciudadanos han entendido. Lo que, en qué consistía la globalización. La globalización consistía en que nada nos era ajeno en el mundo que un virus en otra parte del mundo podría generarnos un problema a todos, que teníamos que competir por los mismos productos, que teníamos que competir para sacar la vacunación. Ese es eh, el valor de Europa, esa es la, la importancia de Europa. Sin embargo, desde el Comité de las Regiones yo creo que hay un, un asunto importante que tratar en esta conferencia del futuro de Europa, que es el futuro de nuestras áreas rurales, de nuestras zonas rurales. Por eso representamos a las regiones, no solamente a los ciudadanos. Está bien que Europa defienda los derechos individuales, pero Europa no debe de olvidar eh, lo que sienten eh, los ciudadanos que viven en nuestras inmensas áreas rurales. Si olvida esto, volverá a suceder lo que sucedió con el Brexit. Si la gente quiere saber la importancia de tratar los problemas de la despoblación, del mundo rural, eh, que mire el mapa de votaciones del Brexit y mire dónde se produjo la votación contraria a Europa. Tenemos que ser capaces de eh, poner en el foco eh, el problema de la despoblación. Tenemos que ser capaces de eh, poder dedicar un tiempo en esta conferencia del futuro de Europa a nuestras inmensas áreas rurales. No puede ser que el Green Deal, que el Acuerdo Verde, eh, se haga a costa de quienes viven en los pulmones verdes de Europa. No puede ser eh, que el futuro de la conectividad, de las smart cities, de la tecnología, sea solo para las grandes ciudades. La tecnología, el Acuerdo Verde, todo eso tiene que eh, eh, llegar a nuestras eh, inmensas áreas rurales. Por eso tenemos un comité de las regiones y no solamente un parlamento, para que se escuche la voz también de los territorios. Hay servicios que no se prestan a los ciudadanos, hay servicios que se prestan a los territorios. Los servicios medioambientales, los servicios de infraestructuras, todos esos servicios tienen que llegar eh, al corazón de nuestras eh, áreas rurales. Si perdemos el vínculo, si seguimos generando esta desafección eh, entre estas áreas rurales de toda Europa y el proyecto europeo, eh, veremos crecer un gravísimo problema político. Está bien que nosotros defendamos los derechos individuales. Está bien que Europa sea eh, el triunfo del Estado de Derecho frente al autoritarismo. Está bien eh, lo que para nosotros como liberales es esencial, que es el triunfo de las libertades individuales. Pero no olvidemos que hay inmensas zonas dentro de Europa que se sienten desafectadas, que ven en peligro su futuro, su futuro eh, como regiones, su futuro financiero. Y esta conferencia eh, del futuro de Europa tiene que tener muy presente, muy presente el futuro de nuestras inmensas áreas rurales. Thank you very much, Mr. Ciampetti from the ECR Group. Gracias, Presidente. Onorevoli deputati, cari colleghi, intervenendo meno di due settimane fa nella sessione plenaria della conferenza sul futuro per l'Europa, ho sottolineato come il principio di sussidiarietà debba essere al centro delle nostre riflessioni. La nuova Europa ha bisogno di un nuovo modello di democrazia e questo obiettivo può essere solamente colto con un grande sforzo semplificativo che restituisca ai livelli più bassi dell'organizzazione pubblica il potere di scelta e di indirizzo entro ambiti precisi, con risorse e possibilità certe. Da questa esigenza, con lungimiranza, fu posto il principio di sussidiarietà alla base della stessa Unione Europea e il Comitato delle Regioni è il luogo dove è possibile lavorare con qualità per questo obiettivo. Non dimentichiamo qual è il motto dell'Unione Europea, unita nella diversità, 
perché abbiamo dato vita a una grande comunità che può esaltare tutte le sue componenti. L'Unione Europea non è l'omogenizzazione indistinta di saperi, delle culture e delle tradizioni, è invece la somma delle nostre identità, una somma dove è possibile riconoscere ogni elemento e dove ogni elemento contribuisce a dar vita a una nuova e dinamica realtà. Vale anche per noi europei quello che Matt Maganti diceva a proposito del frammentato continente indiano. La nostra capacità di raggiungere l'unità nella diversità sarà allo stesso tempo la bellezza e il banco di prova della nostra civiltà. Naturalmente l'integrazione europea è un processo fondamentale. Traiamo senz'altro beneficio dalla cooperazione nei settori del libero mercato, della politica di coesione e della politica energetica, come quella dei trasporti o per la lotta ai cambiamenti climatici. In questi settori la nostra cooperazione va soltanto, non soltanto mantenuta, ma addirittura rafforzata. In, in molti altri settori invece notiamo come il ritmo dell'integrazione sfugga ormai al controllo dei vari livelli istituzionali, dalle amministrazioni locali e regionali ai governi e ai parlamenti degli Stati membri. Sempre più spesso all'Unione Europea vengono trasferite nuove competenze che non le sono attribuite dai trattati o che i trattati definiscono in termini molto generali. Il mio auspicio è che la conferenza per il futuro dell'Europa non sia un tentativo di legittimare ulteriormente il centralismo burocratico europeo o il centralismo dei singoli stati. Purtroppo però scorgo una serie di segnali preoccupanti in tal senso. Uno di essi è dato ad esempio dalla composizione del suo comitato esecutivo in cui sono rappresentati a pieno titolo soltanto tre gruppi politici del Parlamento europeo. Poi nella sessione plenaria del 19 giugno è stata proposta come panacea per risolvere i problemi dell'Unione Europea l'abolizione della regola dell'unanimità. È un passaggio che lascia perplessi, che va affrontato con estrema prudenza perché contiene in sé il rischio dell'annichilimento di ogni forma di dissenso e la marginalizzazione delle minoranze e delle istituzioni minore. Possiamo permetterci di correre questo pericolo in un momento storico in cui in troppe realtà minoranze e oppositori vengono spesso brutalmente zittiti l'Unione Europea deve difendere la democrazia grazie Presidente Thank you. The floor now to Ms. Maupertius, please. merci Monsieur le Président uh, un Europa di tutti i popoli une Europe de tous les peuples cela semble de la rhétorique ce n'en est pas alors que l'Europe est partout, que nous sommes l'Union européenne, il y a encore trop de gens qui ne se sentent pas écoutés. Nous pouvons débattre si l'Union européenne doit modifier ses traités pour relever les défis futurs, comme cela a été évoqué, mais avant tout, nous devons réfléchir à la manière de rendre l'Union européenne plus inclusive et plus démocratique. La conférence sur l'avenir de l'Europe est l'occasion idéale de recueillir et d'obtenir les réactions des citoyens et nous pensons que les mécanismes liant l'Union européenne à ses concitoyens doivent perdurer au-delà de la conférence. Nous voulons une Union européenne qui s'adresse à tous ces citoyens, qu'ils vivent dans une capitale, dans un petit village. L'Union européenne gagne en influence si elle est capable de parler la langue des gens, y compris la langue des minorités. L'Union est plus visible lorsqu'elle favorise le patrimoine culturel local, ce qui nous rend si fiers de faire partie de l'Union. L'Union est plus intégrée et plus cohérente lorsqu'elle assure la connectivité entre ses périphéries et le centre. Ainsi, les citoyens vivant dans les îles, par exemple, méritent d'avoir les mêmes opportunités que leurs que leur pères vivant sur le continent et doivent bénéficier des opportunités du marché unique et numérique européen. L'Union, avec son solide plan de relance, a prouvé qu'elle peut relever les défis du XXIe siècle et que la solidarité est au cœur du projet européen. Pourtant, nous regrettons que les compétences des régions et des villes aient été négligées, malgré le fait que nous ayons été en première ligne pour faire face à l'impact de la Covid et atténuer ses effets néfastes sur les territoires. Pensons-nous vraiment que la centralisation soit la solution à leurs problèmes le pacte vert ou la transition numérique deviendront-ils des réalités sans l'apport des régions, des villes, des villages qui sont en charge de la mise en œuvre 
Nous avons besoin de plus de décentralisation, plus de collaboration et de respect pour les niveaux infranationaux. Il est temps de passer à l'action et de faire appliquer le principe de subsidiarité, valoriser le rôle des territoires et ensemble, nous pouvons faire la différence. Merci beaucoup. Mr. Frey, please, from the Greens. Sehr geehrter Präsident, sehr geehrte Mitglieder des Europäischen Parlaments, sehr geehrte Kolleginnen und Kollegen, die Erwartungen an die Konferenz zur Zukunft Europas sind für die grüne Fraktion in zweierlei Hinsicht groß. Das gilt zunächst für die neuen inhaltlichen Schwerpunkte, die jetzt alle ergebnisoffen diskutiert werden müssen. Dabei dürfen auch unbequeme Themen nicht ausgeklammert werden, wie beispielsweise die Einstimmigkeit im Rat, die Verwendung von Haushaltsmitteln im, Arbeit im Agrarbereich, der Klimawandel und die Rechtsstaatlichkeit. Große Erwartungen gibt es aber auch zur Bürgerbeteiligung auf europäischer Ebene und zur Frage, wie diese ehrlich gelingen kann. Ich bin davon überzeugt, dass die Partizipation der Bürgerinnen und Bürger nach dem Bottom-up-Ansatz erfolgen muss. Die Bürgerinnen und Bürger müssen konsequent in die Arbeiten der Konferenz in ganz Europa eingebunden werden. Die einzelnen Foren müssen die Vielfalt der Bevölkerung widerspiegeln, ohne jemanden auszuschließen. Also unabhängig von Religion, Rasse, Hautfarbe, Herkunft, Geschlecht, politische oder sexuelle Orientierung. In meiner Region Baden-Württemberg haben wir diese Art der Bürgerbeteiligung mit Dialogmodellen und sogenannten Zufallsbürgerinnen schon erfolgreich praktiziert. Ich kann dieses Vorgehen deshalb nur empfehlen, auch für transnationale oder interregionale Bürgerdialoge. Wichtig ist in allen Bereichen, dass diese Bürgerinnen und Bürger die Wirkung ihrer Beteiligung dann aber auch spüren. Das muss heißen, dass Meinungen, die auf der Plattform oder im Bürgerforum prioritär genannt werden, über die Arbeitsgruppen und das Plenum in den Exekutiv Exekutivausschuss und in die Schlussfolgerungen der Konferenz Eingang finden. Nur wenn wir unsere Menschen in den Regionen Europas ernst nehmen, gewinnt die Europäische Union an Glaubwürdigkeit. Dafür müssen wir alle und können wir alle bei dieser Konferenz Verantwortung übernehmen. Dankeschön. Dankeschön. The floor to Mr. Legard for one minute. Okay, the floor to um, Hirache Garcia for the closing statements. Thank you, President. Eh, y, y gracias a, a todos y, y a todas por vuestras aportaciones que con distintas sensibilidades, porque evidentemente Europa es diversidad y, y es eh, eh, el poder enriquecer un proyecto desde distintos puntos de vista, estoy segura que compartimos eh, objetivos eh, comunes, eh, que es eh, cómo construir más y mejor Europa. Eh, y lo vamos a hacer eh, de la manera en la que hemos entendido eh, que podíamos eh, conseguir representar esa, esos distintos puntos de, de vista. Escuchaba al señor Chiambetti eh, hacer referencia ¿no? a, a que la conferencia o la estructura de la conferencia del futuro de Europa no representa la, la realidad eh, de las instituciones, puesto que en el caso del Executive Board eh, por el Parlamento Europeo eh, solo estamos eh, tres miembros de los eh, tres grupos mayoritarios y simplemente por aclarar y, y que eh, también conozcáis eh, lo que es el funcionamiento que hemos establecido eh, en la negociación para sacar adelante esta conferencia, insistimos mucho como Parlamento Europeo la necesidad de que estuvieran eh, todos los grupos representados en el Executive Vote y por lo tanto, aunque es bien cierto que solo somos eh, tres eh, full members, eh, actuamos eh, como institución y como Parlamento Europeo de forma conjunta. Eh, para nosotros, eh, para los siete miembros de, del Parlamento Europeo en el órgano ejecutivo, eh, todas las decisiones las tomamos de manera consensuada. Entendemos perfectamente lo que supone también el respeto a, a todo tipo de, de posiciones eh, y por eso también trabajamos eh, para que en la representación de los parlamentos nacionales eh, pudiera haber un número mayor de cara a garantizar esta pluralidad. 
Europa no se puede ser entendida eh, si no es eh, con, con la diversidad eh, y entendiendo que hay distintas eh, posiciones y por lo tanto para mí es algo eh, que respeto eh, como un valor fundamental de la, de la Unión eh, Europea. A partir de ahí cada uno pondremos nuestras prioridades, pero creo que todos y todas hemos coincidido en que tenemos retos comunes eh, y que vamos a trabajar por ellos, por hacer más y mejor Europa y por conseguir también un equilibrio en la conferencia del futuro de Europa entre lo que son los debates realmente políticos, de contenido político y los debates institucionales. Estoy de acuerdo con lo que decía eh, el señor Speich, eh, que necesitamos hablar del derecho de iniciativa en el Parlamento Europeo, porque evidentemente, como bien saben, somos eh, la única institución eh, europea elegida directamente por los ciudadanos a través de su voto. Y creo que debemos abordar esas, eh, esos debates, igual que el de la unanimidad, eh, que en muchas ocasiones está bloqueando políticas fundamentales y necesarias para, para Europa. Eh, creo que podemos hacerlo, que estamos preparados para ello, pero también para incorporar una dimensión de los niveles locales y regionales que todos y todas vosotros representáis. Así que eh, insisto en ponerme a vuestra disposición eh, y, y, y conseguir eh, que podamos profundizar eh, a lo largo de estos próximos meses en los debates que tenemos por delante. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. The floor to Manfred Weber for his closing remarks, please. Yeah, thank you so much for for all the comments and uh, I think we share a lot of points. For example, the question of rural areas. I like this very much. Not only cities in mind. Also, the question of being aware about the risks of this whole exercise. If we create expectations from a citizen's point of view, we also have the risk to create disappointment if we are not delivering. So, I think we, we have the same common understanding. Uh, I would I would only point out two subjects which are for me important. First of all, about the question, I would say the idea is not more Europe per se. That's not the idea of the exercise. My idea is really to have to have a better delivery process to what people expect from Europe. So to have a better Europe, a functioning Europe, that is what we need. That people see in their daily life, like with a COVID certificate in their hand on their mobile phone, that Europe helps me in my daily life that things are getting better. That is what we need, a better Europe, a functioning Europe, a close to citizen Europe and not a more Europe per se. Uh, and 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 I have a lot of mention mention a lot of colleagues mentioned the subsidiarity point. I I know the the concern behind that Europe is doing again a legislation, again a rule, again a bureaucracy, and so on. That's not what we need. But I tell you, when I have the images from Bergamo one and a half years ago in mind, when our Italian friends suffered first in the European Union on the COVID crisis, and they had no protecting masks anymore in their in their hand. And in Germany, in Austria, in France, and so on, they didn't give them the necessary medical uh, uh, thing. Then we cannot argue with subsidiarity. Then we need clear rules on solidarity on European Union. And when we currently discuss about the Indian variant on COVID, then I cannot accept to argue with subsidiarity when it is about implementing the Schengen rules. I want to have a European-wide ban on areas where we have a variant which is dangerous for us as Europeans. It makes no sense that Germany, France and Italy makes a different approach on uh, travel bans to India, for example, or to Great Britain. That is what we need. So that's why a functioning Europe, where people see that this is really working. And that is what I want to answer. And finally, I think we all are aware that we have a great chance and we can achieve it if all pro-Europeans, those who believe truly in a, de a strong development for Europe, are working together. And that is what we for sure will achieve. I'm, I'm sure about this. Thank you very much, Manfred. Uh, let me give the floor now to Guy Verhofstadt for his closing remarks as well. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, President. So, very short, um, there has been uh, raised the issue of the uh, short time that uh, this conference will run. That's true, uh, but it's a fact. And uh, yeah, I'm an optimist by nature. Uh, I think as politician, it's necessary the, to be optimist by nature. Um, but I think that uh, finally, that's uh, maybe uh, a, a good thing. If we have not a lot of time, 
uh, because we need to come forward with a number of conclusions already in March that will, in my opinion, just create uh, an environment, enough pressure to come forward with bold and courageous proposals. So uh, uh, I have never seen uh, in, in, in politics uh, good things coming out when we had a lot of time. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's good that in such a short period, we organize and the citizens panels and the plenaries and deliver the conclusions uh, that are needed. And that brings me to a second point that has been raised and Manfred uh, already uh, touched about that, uh, the, the whole question of uh, subsidiarity uh, uh, and federalism and so on and so on. Look, let's be very clear about this. What, better, what can be better done on the European level, because there is an added value given by the European uh, level, we need to do that. And what is better done uh, with an added value on the local level or the regional level or sometimes the national level, that needs to be done on that level. So instead of having a theoretical discussion about yeah, subsidiarity, yeah, subsidiarity, no, naturally subsidiarity is a basis principle for the union, but it means also that where we can prove that there is added value, there is a better result if we work together, we need to do that. And we need to be courageous and also to elaborate further on different forms of subsidiarity, because I agree that subsidiarity for the moment is a little bit a negative thing. You can block uh, 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 proposals for legislation, not uh, um, how uh, encourage or initiate uh, proposals for legislation. Uh, so uh, that are my two uh, small remarks that I wanted to make, but I want foremost salute the unanimity uh, in all the interventions to, uh, to say that this conference is not only important, but that this conference needs to be a success. Look, we live in a world, and we're going to live in a world where it's completely different of the world of, uh, of yesterday, certainly, and even of today, with two big powers, China and, uh, and, and, and America, with two competing models. And I have to tell you, I like neither the one and certainly not the other, the Chinese model. It's time that uh, we take stock of that, that we are uh, conscious uh, about the need to uh, better develop based on the European civilization or European model. And the Conference on the Future of Europe is certainly uh, a way to achieve that. Thank you, President. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Verhofstadt. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all three of you for participating in this very interesting debate uh, for uh, the Committee of Regions, but for the European citizens, uh, most importantly. And uh, I want to reassure you uh, once again that we are committed, absolutely committed, into making this conference uh, on the future of Europe a success. Uh, our team uh, of people uh, who represent us in the plenary uh, is ready uh, to give their best towards acquiring this goal. I, our high-level group on democracy that we created with uh, Henman van Rompuy chairing it uh, along with uh, a very experienced group of people uh, is here to provide us with advice. So we are, uh, with all our strength, near uh, uh, next to you uh, in order to make this uh, effort a success. And we will make it. We will make it a success together, involving always citizens and their real needs. So thank you very much for uh, being here with us today. And uh, we will uh, certainly collaborate a lot during the months to come. Thank you very much to all three of you for your time and your efforts. Thank you. And uh, dear colleagues, uh, we are beginning our debate now on the European Democracy Action Plan. I would like to give uh, uh, the floor to the first vice president who will preside this meeting because I have an urgent matter that I need to attend, Mr. Uh, Vasco Cordeiro. And I would definitely would like to uh, ask, uh, thank very much uh, uh, the vice president uh, of uh, the European Commission for Values and Transparency, uh, Ms. Jourova, who is uh, joining us for this very interesting debate. Thank you very much, Commissioner. The floor to Vasco Cordeiro uh, for chairing 
the rest of the today's plenary. Thank you. Well, thank you, Apostolos. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, the Vice President of the European Commission for Values and Transparency, Vera Jourova, for a debate 